Right, so my name is uh, Dita Dienfeldt. You can call me Didi. Um, most people do, and it's completely okay. Uh, I'm a game designer. I'm a associate lead game designer. If you want a full fancy title, but it doesn't really mean that much. Uh, and I work at Massive. Um, and uh, I, it, it said in the program I was going to give you all the advice about how to make games in a game jam. I don't think I have all the advice. Uh, so, but I put together a little presentation. I'm going to try and be really quick because I know that you guys probably just want to go out and make your games. Um, and I, uh, disclaimer is that I did not have time to rehearse this. I did another presentation today, so I might be a little bit confused, but usually it, it, it's probably going to be uh, okay. Right, so. This is a little bit about my background, really quickly. I've studied philosophy, I have gone to the IT University to study games. Um, I've always played computer games. Uh, some of you may be too young to recognize some of the things that are up there. Uh, but I've always been a gamer. I've also been a tabletop role-playing gamer, a, you know, board games, whatever, any kind of game. Always loved it, always played it. Uh, I've done some theater, production of theater and whatever, so I've dabbled a little bit with, with everything. Uh, but right now, I work at Massive. Um, these are some of the games that I've made. Uh, one of them is probably one of them you might recognize. Um, and uh, I was the uh, creative lead for the co-op part of Far Cry 3. So it's a very small part of Far Cry 3, which is a, mainly a single-player game. Um, but uh, yeah, I was the game designer for that. And the other games are some of the games that I've made when I've been to game jams, because I think what I can offer just in terms of advice or whatever I may have to say to you, I can do it from a position of someone who actually works AAA. You no, know, I've released big titles, I've worked for years and years and years of huge titles, but at the same time and during those productions, I would still go to game jams. Because I love game jams and I love like the freedom that you get. So these are some of the things that I've done in game jams as well. This is why I love game jams. Um, you have freedom to do a lot of things. You may feel like you're constrained by time and by the theme and by everything that you're doing, but you have so much freedom. You can do crazy stuff if you want. You can do like things with custom hardware. You can you know, do things that you know for a fact could never ever sell. I know they're gonna look at markets, like the market of the things that you do, but I'm, not, I'm gonna undermine the, the organizers here and say, screw that. This is like one of the chances when you make games, you get to make things that aren't marketable. Things that you know you could never sell, but would be a great idea, would be fun, and people would have fun playing it, and fun seeing it would be inspired by seeing what you do. But that's the freedom that you can get from a game jam. This is just like a free space. You get to put your own message into the game. That's stuff that it's really hard for me to get something that's personal, that's mine, into a game like Far Cry 3. There's stuff there. There's stuff that I have shaped, but I mean, that game does not represent who I am. There's, there's parts of it that represents who I am as a game designer, but there's very little of me in there. You get here right now, you can make a game that's you. When your friends see it, they're going to be like, ah, you totally made this. I can see that it's you. Either because you have something to say, or just because, you know, you're awesome and you put that awesomeness in your game. It can even be like a certain word that you usually use, that one of the characters use all the time, and then your friends will be able to see, well, you made it. That's something that you can do. It's fun. Um, and it makes me smarter. It makes me so much smarter. This is, I, I learned more about who I am as a game designer. We all have a personal style. We all have like themes that we like or things that we do. And I learned more about that from going to game design, or to game jams, than I did, you know, working three and a half years on a AAA title. And one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons it makes me smarter is this is a tiny little um, full game production all wrapped into 48 hours. And I didn't realize this before I had gone through the whole process of shaping Far Cry 3. That a lot of the things that you go through here, super compact, is almost like completely comparable to what we go through when we make those big games. And that's really valuable for you to think about because it means that if you ever end up in one of these big companies, if you even want that, um, you will recognize some of the stages, but they're just gonna be really slow down compared to what you've seen here. Yes, think about why you're here. Uh, you, you, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, but I'm here to make games, but there's so many reasons for you to be here. You know, are you here to learn? Are you here to win? Are you here to have fun? Are you here to meet people? 
it's it's just a valuable thing to think about. Um, like if if you don't know it, think about like what would you be disappointed about when you left Sunday? You know, if you hadn't finished your game, would that be like not cool? If you had just sat in the corner and not met anyone, would that be not cool? If you'd made something that wasn't fun, but you learned a lot, like just take a little bit of time to think about why you are here. Because that's gonna mean so much when you interact with your group that you can actually say, guys, I'm just here to have fun. Let's not argue, let's well, fine, we'll just do your thing. I'm here to have fun, I'm here to learn. Or you can be like, I want to win. Everybody who is with me should want to win. You need to be able to communicate these things and you can't if you don't know. <sighs> okay, so now it's gonna be a little bit of the designer fuss. Uh, but what game is it? Some people will say like this, it's a game about something, you know, and I say that's bullshit. That's not how you describe a game. That's how you describe story. You can have stories in games, but games are not stories. Example, you can have a story about a superhero who loses his powers, but then everything turns out okay anyway. There's a ton of things that you can do with a story. <laughs> if you put it in a movie, if you, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with it. But if you want to describe it in a game, this doesn't describe a game to me, because I don't know what I would be doing. If you want to talk about it as a game, you have to start using actions, right? You have to say, it is a genre game where the player does these things. Then you're describing to me what game you're making. And I'm saying this now because you will be talking a lot about the game that you will be making, and try to use action words. Try to say what the player will be doing in the game, because that is the game. I have examples with comics. Um, maybe it's a platform game where the player will solve puzzles to make up for his missing superpower. So maybe before he could just blast his way through the walls, but now he has to, you know, stack boxes to jump over them, right? This is still a story about a superhero. Maybe it's a point and click uh, puzzle adventure where you have to like combine things to make a machine so that you can fly like you used to be able to. Uh, maybe it's um, a fighting game where you don't have superpowers but you're fighting people who have. So how do you deal with that? You know. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that for like for a game, what kind of superpower you had and then lost, if that's the theme of the game, that's going to be super important for the game, right? If you could fly before but you can't now, then that's immediately you're going to think about game mechanics you can do with that, right? If you could. Um, shoot lasers out of your eyes, if you could use x-ray vision, or you could see in the dark, but now you can't, then that's all going to feed into game mechanics that you can do. And that's where the narrative starts to tie into the game, right? But a game is what you do, and you can tie it into the story, but if you want to describe your game, tell me what I'm going to do. Okay, this is a really, really basic, basic thing. But you need to make a game that people will want to play for some reason or the other. My, typically my dad will say like, why doesn't anyone make games about working down at the city hall and planning, you know, stuff. I'm like, I'm like, well, people do make games about that. So people make games about everything. But the main reason why we don't make, make, uh, make games about boring subjects is that we want games to be fun. It's not really that good a word, but we want them to be fun or to be engaging or compelling, or intriguing, or we want them to be fascinating, there needs to be something there that I want to take part of, right? I'm just saying this because it's sometimes in a game jam, you can get so caught up in things that you're doing that you're forgetting you need to make something that's fun. Maybe you find that little sparkle of fun in something where you really did not expect it. Maybe sometimes you just have to scrap everything else and run with that because you are here to make something that is engaging, intriguing, fun. Maybe you're making something that will make people cry because, you know, I don't know what you come up with, but you want to do something. You don't just want to make a Super Mario clone. Not if you're not making it super, super fun. Just saying. Okay, now also we're gonna move it. I'm going really fast here because I want you guys to go out and make games. Um, Talking about game jamming, I know you got a group now. I actually don't know how that happened, like you got divided into groups. Either way, you need to 
talk in your group. What are you good at? What are you like? What are your strengths? What are your roles going to be? Make sure you talk. This doesn't have to take forever. You don't have to do like a Swedish. Uh, uh, everybody gets like. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that everyone knows. <laughs> I worked in Sweden for five years. Um, what are your roles? What are the expectations? This is where you're coming. Like, why are you here? You're like, what do you want to walk out of here with? You know, you need to just talk about that for a little while. Um, right. Um, just looking a little bit, I mean, I went to game jams myself, and I know what usually went wrong for me, and what went right. I looked it up online to see a bit of postmortems for game jams to come up with the things that usually goes wrong, things that usually goes right for people. So, um, usually, this is the top four of things that go wrong for people. They don't know the tools they're working in. They have a problem with time management. They write really bad code and can't make the game work. Uh, and they fail on the theme and idea, and that's usually because they overcomplicate things. Um, and if these are the things that go right. Tools. You work in an engine that you know. You know what it can do, or you work with someone who can teach you. You know what you're doing. You find a way to work with a theme and an idea that really clicks with your gameplay. You keep it simple. I'm probably not the first one who said that, you're making a game in 48 hours. Do not overcomplicate it because you are going to fail. Which is okay, we'll talk about that later. Um, and also, it was like having a great level editor to work in. That's also something that is great. So these are some of the guidelines. I'm getting very practical now. I'm a very practical person. These are just some quick guidelines, especially for those of you who haven't been in game jams before. So, work in a tool that you know. Work in an engine that you know, or make sure you work with someone who knows it really well. Don't try and learn something new right now, unless that's why you're here. I mean, these are guidelines, they're, they're there to be broken, but choose, choose something that you think you can do, right? Um, maintaining easy access is just when you're, like this, this has to do with things like naming conventions, um, version control, uh, that you can easily access, access the assets, Make sure you just like, even something as simple as setting up a folder, a comp shared folder to start with that you can share your assets in. Make sure you just talk, spend five minutes to talk about naming conventions. Um, does, peop, does, does anyone here have no clue what I'm talking about right now? Awesome. Uh, it's going to help you and you are going to make a better game for it if you spend just a little bit of time clearing out the technical details. Um, keep it simple. Yeah, it's just like keep it simple, keep the scope small. If you have the best idea in the world, but you can't do it in 48 hours, then you're still not going to make a game. Right. So then what you do is that you find the core of your intention. You may have this great idea about the superhero, and he loses his powers, and like you, he has all of these powers, it's like eight different powers, and there's like eight different levels that you go to, through forwards, and then he loses his powers and then you go through them backwards but without the powers and then you like it's the same level but you play it backwards and you don't have the powers it's going to be super cool and then in the end you're going to get all the powers back you're going to choose not to have them in some cool cutscene that you're going to make and that's just like yeah that would probably somehow be pretty cool but what you can make in the game jam is probably either going one way with superpowers or going the other way without and just having one so you need to find out what is your intention? What is it that you want the player to experience with that superhero game, right? Is it the loss of powers? Then focus on that. Is it just, just being awesome with the superpowers? Focus on that. Just keep it simple. Find your focus. Go to the core and then do that one thing. Use the theme. This is not a constraint. It's not a limitation that you have a theme and a picture and something to work with. This is a fucking blessing that you are not know what it is. It's like, I love the constraints. I love that I have to find something that has to find and you know, fit into this little one hole because it means I can focus all of my mind powers on that one thing instead of having like to try and take in the whole world. So really, really use that. Really work with it. The best games that you, know, you are in here are going to make are going to be some, going to be games that completely resonate with the theme. People take one look at it and they get it and they get the theme and they can immediately say, this is from a rabbit game jam, this is so awesome. We didn't 
think about Arabic culture in this way, or we didn't know that it worked like that, and this is so awesome. Those are going to be the best games. So just you know, go out and try and make those. <sighs> Practical guidelines. Start working immediately. Um, Sunday, around 10 o'clock, you're going to really wish that you had. So just do it now. <laughs> um, have something playable as soon as possible. I would say no later than about tomorrow at 12. Just something playable. Something that you can start testing. Something that you can feel. You're making a game. You're making something that's interactive, right? So have something that's interactive as soon as you can. Some of you will be able to have something that's interactive tonight already, and that is great. But really try to aim for that. Some of the times I've failed, when I've been to game jams, which is okay, because I've learned from it, um, is when we didn't have anything playable before it was almost too late. And then you have some, and it's just like you don't have time to change it, and then you just have to kind of dress it up and, and send it in, and you just uh, make something playable as quickly as you can. And something playable is basically just booting something up and you have a square that's moving on the screen. That is something playable. You don't have to have pretty art or anything in there. You just need something that you can push some buttons and something happens. That's where you start. Uh, stop adding features before you want to. Just stop adding things tomorrow night. You will have plenty of things to fix, plenty of bugs to fix, plenty of polish to do. Um, and again, all of these things here apply, uh, except for the things with Saturday, apply to AAA productions as well. We all wish we started to do those things earlier. We should have had something playable all along. Looking at you all here, who's the program and work with me on Far Cry 3, he's going to be here all the weekend, right? Yep. <laughs> and we yeah. wished we stopped adding features, features before we wanted to. <laughs> it's the same thing, it's so compressed. Um, oh yes. This, <laughs> make something you can play. This is like, if there's one thing you take with me, with you from my rant today, this is it. <sighs> um, okay, you probably also heard a thousand times that you need people to test your game. The thing is that you need people to test your game. And you need to, to find out whether they get it or not, okay? Do they get it? Not just necessarily what they're doing, but do they get what you're trying to convey? And be gutsy, be brave, have people playtest something that is not done. This is one of the most scary things that can happen to a game developer is that you hand over your thing and it's not done at all, it's not where you want it to be, but you just need to see if people can still figure it out. Even if it's controls or the, the way it works, like just find someone from another group you know, have them sit down and play test what you're doing just for two minutes, see how they react, try and find out what it is that they're reacting to, and then use that as a base. It's going to be invaluable. This is also a thing that is true for AAA productions. It's also true that it's really scary to put people when it's not done, and you just want to go in there and say, it's really not done, so it's going to be a lot better. But you can't, because there's like glass and stuff. Uh, right. This thing. If it's not playable, you can't test it. You can't test it, and you can't have other people to test it. This is what I think. We're starting to get towards the end of the presentation now. Uh, when in doubt, do 2D. Doing 3D is going to take you four times as long. If you know what you're doing, then fine. I'm just saying, if you don't, maybe you want to do 2D. When in doubt, use a grid. <laughs> Also a good thing, your pro programmers are going to like you. Uh, here I'm talking like mostly about like how you move around somewhere. Um, don't forget sound. This is something that is often forgotten. It's something that makes a game, the best games, feel flat if there is no sound. Like even if you're just, if you find something legally that you're legally allowed to use on the internet and put a mu some music on it, then that's better than having a game that's completely silent because that's a half-dead game. Um, and then make the toy first. And this is what I mean when I keep saying it needs to be playable, because you need to have something to play around with. You need to, the programmers need to know that they can do what you're trying to do in terms of game mechanics, 
and the you know the artist needs to know kind of how it moves. Like it's just going to help everyone that you have something. But it's the playable thing. But that's what you usually think about. Okay, so um, I think there's like four slides left or something. <laughs> Uh, there's going to be downtime for some of you. Um, there's going to be time when someone else is working. You're waiting for a playable prototype. You have nothing to do. You feel like there's plenty that you can do. This is for a game jam situation. And I'm not kidding. If you don't have anything to do, go get coffee. Find out what kind of food there's going to be next time. Um, clean out the space where you're sitting. Do the paperwork. You're going to have paperwork. I don't know if you've already done, already done that, but usually there's going to be like a list of things. You're going to hand in the names and who did what. And there's like, find out now what the paperwork is and do it in your downtime so that you're not struggling to do it five minutes beforehand and like everybody else. Like I've done, you know, so many times before I realized that I could just do it, you know, Saturday at two when I was waiting for Bill. So, um, and ask people if there's anything you can do to help them. If you've done all of this and you're still waiting, go and ask some another group if they need help with testing. You know, help each other out. Um, yeah. Three slides left. I said this before, you will fail. Some of you will fail. Some of you will go through times during these 48 hours where you will not have fun. But it's okay to make mistakes in a game jam situation. It's one of the reasons that we go here. It's one of the reasons that I go here, so that I can try out crazy stuff. And sometimes it doesn't work, but it's not going to cost millions. You know, it's just going to cost you your time. You're putting that in here anyway, and you will learn from the mistakes that you make, right? So dare to make those mistakes, and if you do, no sweat. You've learned something. Next time you go to a game jam, you're going to be better. Next time you make a game, you're going to do better. Learn from each other's mistakes. Just don't be like, oh my god, they didn't finish. That was so stupid. Try and look at what they were trying to do and figure out why they didn't finish. Like, try and learn from each other's mistakes as well, because you can actually do that. If, you, if you're not just mental, if you're just like looking at it for what it was. Usually when people don't finish, it's because they were over ambitious. Um, listen to feedback. If someone comes up to you and gives you feedback, that is a present that they're giving to you. So listen to it. You don't have to agree, you don't have to do what they say that you should do, but don't just, you know, listen to it. Try to feel, okay, this person actually took their time to come here and tell me something about the thing that I am making. So there is a harsh truth in this, and this is what I tried to draw, is that sometimes a person will give you feedback in a really bad way. They're going to be complete dickheads about it. They're going to crush your dreams. They're going to be nasty, horrible people that you would never ever want to talk to ever and you really don't want to listen to their feedback. And the horrible truth is, those people can still be right in what they're saying. Okay? Those people can still be right and that means you have to find it in you somewhere to dig through all of the nastiness and find what they're trying to say and figure out are they right. And on a side note, don't be a dick. Okay? <laughs> No reason for it. <laughs> um, and yeah, go out there and have fun. It doesn't matter if you fail, it just matters that you go here and you try and you become better and you help each other become better. It, that's, you know, I love game jams. It makes me smarter. Failing makes me smarter. Winning, I, I've won a couple of times. That was also pretty cool. Uh, that also makes me smarter, right? So yeah, I hope that you could use this. Um, so. Happy job.